data centers in Greenland are an obvious thing because there's tons of free energy, green energy from ice melt runoff. Ah, yeah. But one of the issues there is that nobody lives in Greenland to man the data centers. But even few people live in space to man the data centers. So I would I would hope that you would solve the Greenland issue first, use all that enormous amount of energy before you, you okay, go forward. Okay, set our sights. So before we reach for the sky, let's sort out things down here on Earth, yeah? Hello, and welcome to Environment Variables, brought to you by the Green Software Foundation. In each episode, we discuss the latest news and events surrounding green software. On our show, you can expect candid conversations with top experts in their field who have a passion for how to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions of software. I'm your host, Chris Adams. Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Week in Green Software, where we bring you the latest news and updates from the world of sustainable software development. I'm your host, Chris Adams. This week, we'll be talking about data centers in space, sweeping changes in reporting climate laws affecting the digital sector, making Kubernetes clusters into low Kubernetes clusters, and a set of interesting looking coming events. But before we dive in, let me introduce my esteemed guest for this episode of This Week in Green Software. This week, we have Anne Curry. Hi, Anne. Hello. Anne, would you just introduce yourself? My name is Anne Curry, and I am currently one of the community co-chairs for the Green Software Foundation. I'm a software engineer. I was a software engineer for many years, many years, and 30 years I've been in the industry. And so I date from the time in the 90s when we used to build software using the same kind of techniques that we might, that we're thinking about using today for green software, because machines were very weak then, and we had to handle that. So that's my perspective on this. Cool. Thank you, Anne. So if you are new to this podcast, my name is Chris Adams. I am the executive director of the Green Web Foundation, a nonprofit focused around us reaching an entirely fossil free internet by 2030. And I'm also the policy chair, the chair of the policy working group in the Green Software Foundation. Each week, we do a run through of stories that caught our eyes or that might be fun to discuss. And everything we do discuss, we share all the links that we can find for you to dive down your own little Wikipedia kind of holes after this session. All right. So, Anne, should we look at the first story that came up here? It's mm. data centers move into space to mitigate power consumption and pollution. So this is the story from El Pais, a Spanish newspaper. And uh, they published this story, I think, ostensibly. It's about this program called Ascend, which is Advanced Space Cloud for European Net Zero Emissions and Data Sovereignty Program. That's it. That's not so, that's not a little bit contrived at all. Maybe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, the European Union has selected Thales Alenia Space, a joint venture between Thales Group in France or Thales, possibly. I'm not quite sure if I'm pronouncing that correct. And the Italian defence conglomerate Leonardo. And the plan is to see if you can create space data centres here. And I think the plan here is to try to address some of the energy issues related to data centres on the ground. I found like the initial press release for this, but Anne, as a science fiction writer, I figured you might have some reckons here before we dive into this a little bit more, actually. Yes, I do. And I read the piece and it's, it is an interesting piece. From my perspective, I am also a science fiction writer and I've written a series called the Panopticon series and three of them are set in space and address the technology in space. You mentioned, is it all about Arthur C. Clarke? And interestingly, because Arthur C. Clarke was a physicist when he did his for example, his lunar-based novels, mm -hmm. he put realistic technology in it and he often had patents. So he had the first patent on an electromagnetic cannon in space, which uses electromagnetic fields to fire stuff around. Or It was a, an idea of delivery mechanism for getting stuff from the surface of the moon into orbit. Oh, well, did you say that Arthur C. Clarke patented the rail gun? Is he that... did, yes, he did. Oh my God, my mind is blown. Go on, please do go ahead. That's, I'm never going to think of Quake another way. That's changed how I think of Quake. <laughs> but I, think, I don't think he was thinking about it in the form of a railgun, but it might be quite specific. Patents are often quite specific. It might be specifically for electromagnetic cannons for the delivery of stuff from the surface of the moon to, to lunar orbit. But anyway, he did have the patents on that, which is now expired because it was quite a long time ago. But anyway, 
So that all that stuff does all work. And in fact, there's loads of interesting things you can do with rail guns in space as a way of as a transport mechanism or a power transport mechanism as well. But anyway, there's that's a side thing. In terms of data centers in space, obviously, you've got a lot of power that can potentially be generated in space from solar because you've got nothing in the way between you and the sun and the panels can be in 100 percent light. So it is a very interesting idea. And along those lines, China and India have been cooperating for a while. I don't know if they still are, but they were cooperating a few years ago on a space-based solar power system. So space-based solar power is the idea that you have a giant laser in space and you capture the energy from solar panels and you beam them down, beam Beam it it down down to a panel on the ground, right? Yeah, Yeah, which has some kind of giant death ray connotations around it. So it's not, it depends how you do it. It depends whether you use light lasers or microwaves to get it onto the ground. And then there are lots of, but it's perfectly doable. And I think that's a very plausible idea for getting power, using the same kind of idea of using solar in space to get power down to okay. in, in reusable space. But yeah, it's, so the idea of data centers in space is that you build them out there in orbit somewhere, probably quite a long way out because they don't necessarily need to be a near earth orbit. And that's quite busy. And yet you could just be powering it directly. The difficulty with that is always that it's going to be very hard to maintain that data center. But it did remind me slightly of a story that came up a few years ago, and it's definitely true, which is that Azure have been experimenting with undersea data centers in effectively the size of... um, Yeah, around the Orkneys, in the water. Yeah. Yeah. And those have similar issues in that you put them in and then you can't maintain them. That's it there. So the idea of having a self-contained, smallish data center that no one can subsequently touch is not a new one. So it's not utterly, utterly impossible. And of course, Starlink has got the cost of getting stuff into orbit down quite low. Yeah, so it's not impossible. It's not impossible. It doesn't seem impossible. I So I think I struggle with some of the numbers on this because in this press release, we see something saying, okay, we want to install data centers in orbit powered by solar plants generating several hundred megawatts of power. Now, several hundred megawatts is a very large data center. So like hyperscalers are between 20 to 50 megawatts of power. So you're looking at something like that. And then I also, let's just look at say, okay, the International Space Station, they've got solar arrays right now. They have maybe 120 kilowatts of power coming through, but they're old. And that's two and a half thousand square meters here. So more or less... If you're looking at something which is, I don't know, what is that roughly? That's maybe, that's uh, for 100 kilowatts of power. You're looking at maybe, what, 2,000 square meters per 100 kilowatts. That means for a single megawatt of power, you're looking at 20,000 square meters. And if you're looking for hundreds of megawatts, that's going to be 20,000 square meters multiplied by hundreds. That's a lot of solar to have in the sky. This is the thing I was struggling to get my head around. Things might have got more efficient in the last, say, 20 to 30 years. But surely that is going to be a heavy thing to get into the sky under any circumstances, will it not? Yeah, presumably that is a massively heavy thing to get into the sky. But launch has really come down in price a lot. And of course, it doesn't have to be particularly co-located with the data sensor because you can use those space-based solar power death rays to the subject of my last science fiction novel called Death Ray. <laughs> so you can you don't have to be right by the thing. You could have those arrays literally millions of miles away in space and beam it back. You do get dilation on the beams if they're too far, but you can keep relaying them. Okay, so we could have our data centers in some orbit and then the solar panels further out. So they're far away from there. Okay, so that's one thing. Then you mentioned that there's different kinds of orbits, right? So as I understand it, there's kind of low Earth orbit, like LEO, which is Starlink, and that's maybe 2,000 kilometers above the ground. Then would that mean you're hidden from the sun so that it's dark for your satellite sometimes? Yes, I think it does. I think you have to be a reasonable distance out before you can Yeah, so geostationary, I think, is like a bit bit further out where it looks like you're not moving because you're that much further out, right? Yeah. And you've asked me a question I don't know the answer to here. I do not know how far you have to go out to be constantly in the sun. Yeah. But to be honest, it's just less busy further out. So if you can be further out, there are loads of reasons why you might prefer to do that. And yeah, it's just a matter of then beaming the power back. 
and now I'm with you on this. And then this feels like latency is going to come up at some point, right? Because I'm curious about, because in the Leo, like a low Earth orbit, 2,000 kilometers, we already use CDNs for like to have things close. So if it's 2,000 kilometers, that's one thing. But if it's something, I think geostationary is something like, it's either 20,000 kilometers into the sky or 40,000 kilometers into the sky. So that's going to be... I don't know if speed of light is what 180,000 kilometers per second. That's going to be a significant chunk of latency, no matter what you do. And that's even if it's just you going straight up and down. And if you're going around the world, that's going to be even harder, surely. Yeah, low Earth orbit latency isn't too much of an issue. It depends, but it, the further you go out, the more there is. If you had your data center on the moon, latency is about a second each way. No, it's half a second each way, but it's, it's a total latency is say about a second, which is obviously. It wouldn't make for a very good podcast or a Zoom call, but it depends on your use. And it depends, just depends whether latency is an issue or not, because sometimes bandwidth is more of an issue than latency. So, okay, yeah. Yeah, it all depends what you do, what you're doing with it and where it's going and how much. I, mean, I would guess that the whole point was a lot of the things they're talking about, like in that article they were talking about, data that they gathered in space being analysed in space using a big array of CPUs and then beamed back in a more compressed form back to Earth. In that case, latency is not an issue in any way. But if you wanted to move all data centres into space, then latency would be a giant issue. As you say, CDNs and stuff on the edge. Yeah. And the final thing, we'll stop on the space part because there's other things we're going to talk about. But the final thing that really kind of, because I just scratched my head about this, because last week we spoke all about using different kinds of ways to keep computers cool, right? Now, when you're in space, one of the arguments seems to be that because it's so cold anyway, you don't need to worry about cooling. I don't think that's how I understand physics. As I understand it, there are three ways to cool things down. There's radiation, convection, and conduction. And I'm not familiar with that many cool breezes in space, so I can't <laughs> rely on conduction. Maybe convection, not very much. So that just leaves radiation. And those pictures of the space shuttle with its doors open, it's open to radiate out heat because it's got so much heat still. So I feel like if you've got this issue where data centers generate lots of heat and there's no way to get rid of them, this feels like a problem that I don't see how it's going to be solved by putting things into space that people haven't really taken on board yet. And and I'm struggling with this. Maybe you've got some pointers or maybe it does sound just bonkers. No, you're not just bonkers. It is. it is. You're completely reliant on radiation. And they have quite good things where they have little radiating shapes and stuff that mm -hmm. can radiate off heat more quickly. But it's not easy. <laughs> so it's not easy. It feels to me like you'd be able to do better on the moon because at least you're in mm -hmm. contact with something that can conduct heat away. Depends on how conductive moon dust is and or moon rock is, and I don't know that. Gradually heat up the moon until it glows red. Okay. Indeed, yeah. But yeah, you're right. It's not a no-brainer that we could just go in. It's not like that under sea, sea ones, people go, well, that's great because you don't have to worry about cooling if you've got mm. a data center under the sea. And that's true because it could just conduct into the sea and that's fine. But mm. space is not the sea. You can't do it. So yeah, it's not trivial. So we have latency, death rays, and uh, heating. Some of the challenges that may face us if we try to put data centers into the sky. But mm. this is one potential proposed solution to the issues around energy crises or the energy supply for or sustainability issues related to data centers by the sounds of things. And thank you for sharing all this about the providing the science fiction pointers on this because, yeah, this blew my mind when I first saw it. And I think that you've actually shared a lot of useful things on this. I think it will happen. I think it'll happen. But I think there are other things that data centers in Greenland are an obvious thing because there's tons of free energy, green energy from ice melt runoff. Ah, yeah. But one of the issues there is that nobody lives in Greenland to man the data centers. But even fewer people live in space to man the data centers. So I would, <laughs> I would hope that you would solve the Greenland okay. issue first, use all that enormous amount of energy before you... You okay, go set our sights. So before we reach for the sky, let's sort out things down here on Earth, yeah? Yeah. All right. Okay, cool. Thank you, Anne. All right, next story is a sneak peek about a new book coming out. Anne, I think this is this is your thing. It's a coming O'Reilly book called Building Green Software. We were quite excited about some of this because there's a couple of co-authors who also have been on this, who have also spoken on this podcast. Han, I'm going to hand over to you to talk a little bit about this because you're far more familiar with it than I am. And yeah, you know it better than I do. So please do tell more. Yes, so this is an O'Reilly book that we're working on. The O'Reilly book 
called Building Green Software, which is going to be there. It's not the first green software book they've done, but it's the first kind of full picture as opposed to, there are quite a few good niche ones out there for things like web development. But this one is all the things. And there will be me and Sarah Bergman, who is a key part of the Green Software Foundation, and Sarah Sue, who is also a key part of the Green Software Foundation. And so we're writing all together. And the idea is to net down the thinking that we've all, as a community, come to agree on about what's the right way to do things. So it's all based around the idea that there are three things that we need to be good at. We need to be good at carbon efficiency, hardware efficiency, and carbon awareness. So that's what we'll be talking about in the book. So we'll be talking about carbon efficiency in terms of code efficiency, operational efficiency, plus design efficiency through carbon awareness, how designs that allow you to shift around what you're doing. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that later, I think, in this podcast and hardware efficiency. So don't cause everybody to throw away their phones every time you produce a new version of your software. Because I don't know, you might know the answer to this, Chris, but what has the most embodied carbon per gram of anything in the world? And my guess would be a chip. And in terms of consumer devices, my guess would be, hands down, a mobile phone. Do you know what? I've never actually thought about that in terms of, okay, a single kind of consumer good in terms of post embedded energy inside it. So it's true that there's a significant amount of power that goes into turning sand into silicon and all the other kind of materials there. But also the operation, because silicon fabs are unbelievably difficult to make. Yeah, and of course, and this is actually one thing we should probably talk about in a future episode. When you look at where lots of the really high-end chips are currently made, a lot of them are in Taiwan, which has a very kind of fossil fuel heavy grid. So even if the stuff is really efficient, and even if they were just using electricity, that's going to be one of the problems. But even then, when you are making these, because most of the ways that you achieve the high levels of heat don't rely on electric kinds of power, they rely on but literally heat from combusting fossil fuels, you've got an issue there. This is actually something that's changing. There's a really fascinating paper by Dr. Sylvia Mededu, who's talking about some of the advantages in heat pumps. You can now get heat pumps up to the high hundreds of degrees Celsius, basically. So there are lots and lots of things that could be decarbonized now. But for you to reap those benefits, you actually need to have decarbonized electricity in the first place. And Taiwan is struggling a bit there because it's not a really big place with lots and lots of land and it doesn't actually have much in the way of surrounding kind of shallow water for creating say offshore wind or things like that for the time being so that's going to be an interesting one ahead of us but yes you're right i guess they need the power back beamed in from space on giant lasers yeah maybe what they need is a death ray yes could Uh, come in handy in all kinds of ways if you were taiwan as well i would imagine yeah, let's leave that one there before we get taken off the internet by <laughs> an advanced persistent threat. All right, okay. But, so but let's, anyway, uh, oh, that's, that's an aside. <laughs> the book, the book. So the book, we're beavering away at the moment writing the book. We've submitted quite a few chapters already, so it's all going well. And the idea with the No Riley book, the way they do it, is that you as a writer, you write as you submit the chapters, and as the chapters are at least vaguely polished, vaguely okay, They'll go live for people to read in a kind of advanced read on Safari. So oh, that's the shortcuts be, thing. Yes, yeah, so shortcuts. So people oh, will, be available, will be allowed to read these things. So the introduction has already gone out and it's not live yet, but we're expecting it to go live quite soon. So we will mm. let everybody know through this when it's live and also the code efficiency chapter. And after that, we've got the various other chapters, but they'll, they'll be available in Safari quite, really quite soon. Then the book, the book actually gets physically published and we get an animal. We'll have an animal, but we don't know what the animal's going to be. So at that point, we'll find out what the animal is and the book gets published. And then, uh, so it'll be available to buy in physical form if you so choose. And also at that point, it will also be available. One of the things that we agreed with O'Reilly is that it will also be available in, under a Creative Commons license at that point. So people Ooh, don't even need awesome. to buy it or have an O'Reilly subscription. And because if this is all stuff that is, hopefully by the time we get through this and everybody's reviewed it, it will be, this is just what we want everybody to be doing. This wow. should hopefully be a baseline. That's super cool. I did not realise about the actual Creative Commons licensing for that. That's really helpful. That means that brings the barrier right down. Yeah, oh. but it'll be a while because it takes quite a while for the books to actually come out. So I'm imagining that first quarter 2024. 
will okay. be when that's available, unless we really get our skates on and get it done much more quickly than that. I have one question, if I may, before we move on from this one. I haven't used Safari and I have never written a book, but I have heard horror stories about working with publishers and emailing Word documents back and forth. Is it still that process or is there something like GitHub or what does it look like to write a technical book these days for a technical provider? For O'Reilly, you've got quite a lot of different options. And one of them, the one that we are using is just Google Docs. And so that's super easy because Sarah is in Norway Shira, our editor, is in was on the west coast of the US. I'm in the southeast of England. Sarah isn't too far away from me. She's in London. So that's quite easy to do. But fundamentally, Google Docs are pretty good for that kind of thing. Wow. So Sarah, yourself and Shira. This sounds like Shira, it's Sarah and Sarah. Yeah, it's yeah. really quite hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this is interesting because there are a number of existing green software books. So there's one called Designing for Sustainability by Tim Frick, who's been one of the oh, yeah, yeah. which is very good actually. Yeah, yeah very and good. then Tom Greenwood from Whole Grain Digital. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, that's also very good. His, yeah. yeah, and uh, I think there are a couple of other books that I've seen come out as a number of other ones. But this is the first time I've heard of one of these books, which is actually written by guys who aren't just men, basically. So this is actually quite encouraging. I think this one book may have actually righted the gender balance in the sustainability <laughs> book canon hopefully. yeah well hopefully and there is method in our madness on this in that we wanted to make sure that we got on stage to talk about it as well and we're three women who are very good public speakers so really we should be able to make a load of noise about this good i wish you the best and i'm looking forward to some of the shortcuts for some of this in that case should we look at the next story okay absolutely all right. Okay. This is Microsoft Scales Workload with Carbon Awareness. Now, the actual story is linked from SDX, Edge Central. As far as I can tell, this is basically a kind of press release talking about Microsoft and cloud network stuff. But the thing that was really more specific is actually some of the GitHub issues that we've linked to inside the show notes here. Basically, there is a Carbon Aware operator for Kubernetes to add in a bit of kind of carbon awareness into it by the looks of things. So if you go to github.com slash Azure, then CarbonAware, Kedder operator. There's an open source operator that you can plug into Kubernetes to do this. And I think this is something that we've both discussed before, but I suspect you might have some records on this because I joined a mutual friend of ours. Ross Fairbanks did some work in this field a while ago as well, actually. Yeah. Ross and I used to work on a startup called Microscaling Systems, which was all about cluster scheduling. And one of the things that we always had in mind was adding carbon awareness to cluster scheduling. So moving jobs so that they get wait until there's green carbon available, there's green electricity available on the grid. Now, Google have been talking about this as well. They aren't offering it as a service like this Kubernetes scheduler. But the idea, they've been doing it internally, they've been trialing it internally as a way of shifting workloads in time so, so that they consume green electricity more assiduously than they would otherwise have done. And this is the same idea. Now, as far as I'm aware, this is mostly about being able to compress what's on your machine so you can turn machines off. It's all kind of bin packing on machines because all the machines, you want to compress them in so that there are fewer machines running because they've got loads of containers running on those machines differently shaped and they're all squeezed onto a smaller number of machines at times when there's no green power available and some machines got to get turned off. And in order to do that, you have to have jobs that can wait so it is not just merely a matter of scheduling, and it's two sides of information here. You need to know what the current mix is on the grid and what it's likely to be, which a lot of that goes around weather and grid load. So it doesn't matter if you've got great weather, but you've got high grid load, then maybe you're still not going to have any green power. But if you've got low grid load, maybe you've actually just got too much power and you want to be using it. So it's not just about following the sun or following the wind. So you need this information about what the grid is like, what the weather conditions are on the grid, so to speak. And you also need to know what jobs that are running in your data centers are non-time sensitive, so they can be moved around forward and backwards in time. So the same kind of things that might be running on a spot instance, for example. Now, Google pointed out that with their stuff, they're pretty good at labeling their jobs internally. So they're pretty good at labeling jobs and saying, this is a low priority. You can just wait. If this has to wait at 12 hours, fine. But things like video transcoding for YouTube, sometimes that happens very quickly. You might notice as a user, sometimes it happens very quickly. Sometimes it happens and it takes quite a long time. And that's because Google just go, it's not a high priority thing. So if something needs to wait, that it will be video transcoding. 
So you need jobs that are non-time sensitive and are labelled as non-time sensitive. So as I say, one of the things that Google pointed out that they struggled with a little bit on this is that they can do it internally where things are very well labelled, but they find it very difficult on their public cloud where VMs are just black boxes and they have absolutely no idea whether the contents can wait until there's green power available. So for a scheduler, you need both the information on which to schedule, but you also need the information about the jobs to know which ones are schedulable. There's work to do as a user, as well as just install the scheduler. You will need to start labelling your jobs. And this is presumably something that gets touched on in both books and patterns about the idea of decomposing maybe a particular monolith or a single big program into a number of smaller programs where some bits have to be really low latency responding quickly and the other parts can be moved around. So you can make your CV the carbon or cost savings, presumably. Yes, absolutely. Cool. Yeah, because you won't be moving these jobs, I would imagine. You won't be moving them from data center to data center because, you know, data gravity and all that kind of stuff. But you will be moving them in time. There's really no downside to moving things in time. And so there's no data gravity download. So it's that's where the wind tends to be. So just can I check with, so you mentioned an interesting concept here, data gravity. So data gravity is the idea that one data is in one place. You are not able to move it. It's difficult or expensive to move to another provider. Is there like a technical reason for that? Or what's the thinking behind that? Yeah, it's it's network, it's bandwidth, it's all, and it takes time and blah, blah, blah. But uh, there's an awful lot of data gravity is one of the, re, one of the ways that public so cloud. So we're going to egress fees here, yeah? So paying money to get things out of your cloud storage. Oh. Just by the way, if anyone knew, there's a whole FTC kind of inquiry right now about oligopoly and a competition right now in the cloud sector. So this may be something that if you feel like you would like to be able to do more stuff with in terms of green computing, maybe this is a thing that you might want to respond to the ongoing FTC basic kind of inquiry into this stuff. Because I feel that maybe it'd be better for us to actually be able to move things to more than just two or three clouds. Because data gravity seems primarily to be a kind of business constraint rather than a technical constraint. Yeah, it probably is really. Yeah, technically it's dif- it's difficult, but it's doable. You can get, you could have copies of your data in multiple places. And yeah, you could move it at night. You could copy it, you could do the whole snowmobile thing, copy, copy it all out onto a bunch of disks and drive them across the country. It's not in, an insurmountable problem, no matter how big the, the data is, but it is unbelievably costly. So yeah, and that is fairly insurmountable because you don't, there's nothing much you can do about that. Okay, this is true. Just like the cost of transmission in some places, actually. Mm. All right. So we spoke about the Azure Carbon Aware KEDA operator. So I think maybe we should actually explain what KEDA says because there's something in the briefing here. Yeah, Kubernetes event-driven autoscaler. So the idea would being that this would automatically scale Kubernetes up So you have more computers or more pods and then scale it down again in response to various activities. That's what it would be, right? That sounds plausible. I don't know, but that sounds plausible. And actually, then you just use your normal scheduler and presumably your normal, however you label your pods normally on, how many of these do I need to keep alive at any point? So the ones that are less important to you can just all get shut off. Yeah, there's also another related project to this called Cube Green, which is a project by some folks in Italy, actually. This is early on. It doesn't do quite the clever kind of carbon aware scheduling stuff. But if you want to dip your toes into this, it literally turns off your pods when you go home. So basically, all your staging devices and your developing developer machines at 6 p.m., they switch off and go to sleep just like you might choose to go home and go to sleep. Also in the show notes, we've got a link from the Green Web Foundation where we talk a little bit about this using both Kubernetes and Nomad a while ago. But the stuff from Azure looks really complete and it looks really quite exciting, actually. That is. So I, we ran a sustainability track at uh, QCon London uh, a couple of weeks ago, a big conference, and it was very successful. One of our, I think our top rated speaker was a woman called, another woman, called Holly Cummins, who is a really excellent speaker from Red Hat. I don't know if, if Holly... But she spoke about that her dream was that we'd have effectively light switch operations. So you should be as confident turning off machines on in, in the cloud or your private cloud or public cloud or wherever as you are turning the light off with a light switch. Because when you turn the light off with the light switch, no one thinks, oh, I won't turn the light off just in case it doesn't turn back on again. The <laughs> aim is that you feel that confident about all of your systems that you could just turn them off 
because you don't need them overnight, knowing that you could turn them back on safely in the morning. And her light switch analogy was excellent. It's like you don't leave all your lights on all night just in case you can't turn them back on again in the morning. That would be madness. But that's what we do with computers. One of the best things you can do with your systems is invest in making sure that you can turn them off and then on again. I think that's a useful piece of advice to make sure you can turn your things off and on again. It feels like a low stakes, but I think you and me, we've been on various projects where we've been afraid to do that. So I'm glad that someone is spelling it out that it really needs to be this basic. All right, next story. This is one that really caught my eye because this is the SDIA, who are a Green Software Foundation member, the Sustainable Digital Infrastructure Alliance. The kind of headline is the SDIA welcomes the deal of the European Council and Parliament on Energy Efficiency Directive. This is super like legal blood gump. But basically, there is some really, in my view, quite far-reaching stuff inside this. Essentially, there has been a whole bunch of laws being thrashed out about transparency around energy usage for data centers. And this seems to have snuck through in the first quarter of 2023. And there are some headlines, which are, in my view, which go much further than we are right now. So I'll just read some of this stuff out. So owners and operators of data centers above 500 kilowatts will need to make the environmental performance public at least once a year. This includes annual energy consumption, power utilization, temperature, heat utilization, use of renewable energy, as in how much renewable energy you're using and where it's coming from. And we haven't mentioned it here, but it's also water usage as well. Now, these are figures which I, and you've tried to get, I'm sure you can talk about how easy it is to get access to these figures. Almost impossible. Yeah. And now they're like, it's law, basically. This is coming in. People need to be delivering, do their first reporting in March 2024. So things, something which a large providers have been pushing back against and saying, no, we can't possibly share any of this stuff. Now it's basically going to be part of the law in all around Europe. So if you're outside of Europe, you still may be okay. But this is quite a precedent to be setting in my view. Because, yeah, this is something that a lot of it we've been asking for and really pushing for. And now you've essentially got one block saying, no, this is a condition of doing business in this part of, because how on earth are we going to know if we're on target or not in halving our emissions by 2030, for example? Yeah. And in fact, this was discussed on stage at the QCon conference as well, this time by Adrian Cockcroft, who is the retired VP of Sustainability. He can never remember what the titles of anybody are at AWS. But anyway, he's the big cheese of sustainable architecture at AWS. And he was saying, if you're American, you might think this might this won't affect you because it's just an EU directive and your data centers in the US, who, who cares? But it is basically the GDPR of green. The EU is such a big block. They have so much clout and they exert their will that this is the same way that everybody ended up having to do GDPR. This will be the same. Everyone will have to comply with these things. Even if you think that you're in the US and it won't touch you, the reality of the situation is that this will all spread out AGPL style until everybody is forced to comply in the same way that we've had to comply with the GDPR. That's a win for transparency by the sound of things, but it's probably going to be a headache for a bunch of people who have to start reporting in less than 11 months for the first reporting deadline for this. Oh, yeah. There's also something that I call my eye here is that any data center exceeding one megawatt of power, they need to recover the waste heat. So basically, they need to put it to good use or prove that they, it's either technically or economically unfeasible for them to be doing so. This is a really interesting one because within Europe, at least, and I'm going to speak about Germany where I live, like 40% of the energy demand is from gas heating things up. So if you have this being put to actually addressing one of the other big demands for energy inside Europe, that's actually quite a far-reaching one. And one megawatt, that's likely to impact pretty much every hyperscaler because hyperscalers tend to be 20 megawatts upwards in size. Yeah. And as a kind of... I was trying to do some like rough figures, like 500 kilowatts. If you're assuming maybe 15 to 20 kilowatts per rack. So that's, I know, between 20 to 40 racks of service based on how efficient your data center might be. That's not that big. That's like a lot of data centers this is going to be impacting, basically. Yeah. So we're going to see an awful lot of public heated pools. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, absolutely. I think Ringing there's all every kinds data of uses. center anywhere, everywhere in the world. Maybe this will change how we think about how you build data centers. Like when you build a data center as a kind of big box, out of town, Walmart style thing, then it's really difficult to use the heat. But if you're able to integrate the data center into the kind of fabric of the urban environment, 
then yeah, but you don't really want to have, but you don't. But that has issues of its own. You do not want that generally, because in the urban environment, you want people living. Also, you don't want the draw on the grid, because often those cities, the grids are already overloaded. So it would be counterproductive to have a whole load of data centres now suddenly located in urban environments, just so that they can have a local pool that's heated up using their excess power. I would say that's counterproductive. But unless they're providing or generating any of, their own, any of their own power on site, that's another thing that some of the new providers are doing. They're basically looking at using batteries on site as a way to a, act as a kind of anchor customer, but also to provide use. Because if you have this case where you're scaling machines up and down, there will be times where you should be able to be a kind of active participant in the grid. Just like having a kind of read-write energy grid, just like we have a two-way internet, you could have a two-way grid. But yeah. that's a, another podcast, I suspect. Part of the grid balancing solution, which is absolutely required, particularly when we struggle with grid balancing at the moment. And that's when most of the grid is powered by stuff that is utterly predictable, like gas or coal. When you start adding a whole load of comparatively massively unpredictable solar and wind into the mix, then grid balancing is a major problem. It gets more complicated depending on how much of a grid island you might be. So if you're connected to other things, you, you can get stuff from neighbours. Mm. But if you can't, then it's a bit more complicated. Now, there is some interesting news related to that. I, I assure you we're not an energy podcast. There is <laughs> basically an energy England to Dutch interconnect just announced in the last week. And there's a bunch of similar stuff happening around this field. But we probably need to discuss that another time. And I think we're coming up to the last few minutes of this. And I think there's been a question being that's been posed to us that I think Chris, our producer, shared. If we were to launch one data center into space, what would you name it and why? I am, you could have a bit of a think while that, and I'm going to go for the data face cop out <laughs> answer that people tend to use when faced with this stuff, or what English people tend to use when they get a chance to name things. Boaty McBoatface the well-known research vessel was doing some absolutely fantastic work in the field of climate science. I'll share some links specifically for that because, yeah, Boatface or Sir Richard Attenborough or the Sir Richard Attenborough is its official name. That's a thing. So yeah, that's my example. That's my answer. Data Dataface. What about you, Han? What well, would you call a data center? I don't know, but I can immediately say what I would choose as my naming convention. I would give them culture ship name conventions. Oh, nice. The Ian, Ian Banks culture series, all the AI spaceships name themselves with some slightly tongue-in-cheek name. So of course, I love you one. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I would I would give them culture names. So that's, oh, that's an exercise for the listener to come up with a whole load of... In fact, I believe there is a culture ship name generator online that you can... It will automatically, or to be perfectly honest, Chap GPT will almost certainly supply you with culture ship names that it has made up. So I would defer to Ian Banks and, the, and, a, and a generative AI large learning model for naming our servers. I guess that's circular, if nothing else. All right, I think that <laughs> takes us up to the time we have here. Okay, that's all we have for this episode of This Week in Green Software. All the resources for this episode are in the show description below, and you can visit podcast dot green software dot foundation to listen to more episodes of this particular show thank you very much and for joining us and uh, hopefully see you on one of the future ones so bye for now see you around and goodbye hey everyone thanks for listening just a reminder to follow environment variables on apple podcasts spotify google podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and please do leave a rating and review if you like what we're doing. It helps other people discover the show. And of course, we'd love to have more listeners. To find out more about the Green Software Foundation, please visit greensoftware.foundation. That's greensoftware.foundation in any browser. Thanks again and see you in the next episode.